Laurie, Dr. McCauley, hi. Hey. I'm so glad to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. We've gone through this microphone testing, everyone, uh, before we started, and um, I have a little bit of echo, so I apologize, but it's more important what we're going to be talking about, and that's veterinary rehabilitation. Laurie, I hope it's okay if I call you Laurie, because absolutely everyone knows you're a veterinarian, or many people do know, and those who didn't know, they know now. I find your journey of going through veterinary school and then deciding to pioneer veterinary rehabilitation really captivating and interesting. And I wonder whether there was some sort of defining moment that shifted <laughs> your focus from veterinary medicine to veterinary medicine rehabilitation, because I don't think it should be separated from that. Was there, mm -hmm. a, was there some sort of moment, defining moment, experience? Absolutely. I was in general medicine for six years, and I hate to say it, but I got bored. Right. And so it's like another cat with diarrhea, another dog that's vomiting, you know, anal glands, spays, neuters, all that stuff. And, you know, I did what I did. I loved it. I love my clients. I love my patients. Fell down the stairs at three in the morning, putting my dogs out, hurt my back, and then went to my chiropractor and he couldn't fix me. So I went to an orthopedic guy who sent me to a PT and I went, Oh, you mean you get rid of the pain by doing this and then you strengthen it so it doesn't happen again? That's amazing. I could use this with this patient, this patient. And so I'm like, okay, I want to learn this. And there was no courses, right? There was nothing. At the same time, um, my sister-in-law said, you know, she works with, um, with police dogs. And she's like, listen, if you can find some way to help some of these police dogs, because the surgeons say they're okay, the x-rays look okay, but they don't function the same. I'm like, oh, I can work with them too. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Things happen the way they happen. And I'm like, I want to learn physical therapy for dogs. And I called up um, Robert Taylor from Alameda East, which used to be a TV show, Emergency Vets. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I come work with you? He's like, I never have people come in, but for some reason I'll say yes. <laughs> so I came in, I spent a month with them. We did some research together. I came back and I'm like, okay, I had a brand new son who was six months old. And I'm like, I'll just work three days a week. This will be great. I'll just do this little thing. Poof, right? It like mushroomed. Within a year, I was working 60 to 80 hours a week. Oh. I had to start looking at building a new building because I was in this like 1500 foot square space with a pool that was huge as a big part of it. I designed the first underwater treadmill looking at the dogs and going, if we had some way to have them like raised and not have as much pressure, we could get them to do this. Called up the um, uh, the zoo and said, what kind of glass do you use in your aquariums? Because I need that for my pool. And I hooked up a home security system. So I had a camera and then I had a monitor hanging from the ceiling so that I could watch their gate as they're in the water. And we, you know, we had nothing, right? There was no tanks or anything like that. Wow. So we had our underwater treadmill was a human underwater treadmill on a boat lift. And I learned that if you crank up and down all day long, you get elbow tendonitis. So when we built our new building, we actually put it on a boat lift. So it would be <laughs> hydraulic. So I wouldn't hurt my elbow. Um, I felt a need to learn acupuncture. So I studied acupuncture and then I'm like, oh, I wonder about chiropractic. So I tried hiring somebody. I'll do the acu, you do the chiro. And I'm like, this is too confusing. The only way to know if they're going to need it is to know it. So then I took that course and then thought, I'm going to be in this tiny little building. It's just going to be me. And we turned into, within a couple of years, a 4,000 square foot facility. All we did was rehab. We had three wow. to four full-time doctors, three to four full-time techs. I was the first one to have, instead of <clears throat> excuse me, cages for dogs, we took a garage that was on the original building and made it into six suites and had TVs in our exam rooms. We had uh, dial up sound, right? So relaxing music that if a dog was barking next door, you could turn it up. If you needed a calm, you could bring it down. Oh so invigorating to create this ability to, to help these dogs. And then I, they had the first international um, sports medicine and rehab symposium. And I brought information about the underwater treadmill. And immediately I got asked to, hey, can you teach a certification course? So in 2004, I started mm -hmm. teaching for Canine Rehab Institute, mm -hmm. and that was amazing wow. to work with so many students. We had thousands of people go through. Mm -hmm. It was just mm -hmm. awesome. 
I've literally had interns from 17 different countries and I learned from every single one of them. They're wonderful. Your enthusiasm is so undeniable. Like I, I will not be asking whether you love your job because it's pretty clear. <laughs> I also wanted everyone to know where you're located, even though it sounds like you don't need any clients. I know that people will be asking us, where are you? Where are you? And where all everyone is and if there's any referral um, list, but where are you located? When I had my big clinic, it was in Chicago or outside okay. of Chicago. Okay. So you're Karen's Becker neighbor, basically. <laughs> we, yeah, I was. Now I'm in North Carolina. I moved down here and I went under the radar. So I like I don't have a website. I don't take clients mm-hmm. unless they're referred by somebody mm-hmm. I already know. Um, but you're teaching. I understand. You know, I, I, teach I totally get a lot. it. That I, it gets to a point where no matter how much and how hard we work, we can really help all the clients. So going online and creating courses and doing all that is actually the way to go. And I totally understand because I, I happen to be in a very similar situation where I was thinking, how can I actually pass what I have been learning onto others? And how can I empower dog lovers and people who actually need to know all these things? So I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, opening a first, the first veterinary rehabilitation clinic is, is risky, right? Like what drove you to take the leap and how did you handle all the doubts that initially were there? At least, you know, I would have them, maybe you didn't, but you know, and what challenges came up with it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> challenges every single day. I follow my heart. I'm God led. Mm. And sometimes I'm kicking and screaming and then I still follow and it just mm-hmm. happens. So I'm very blessed that way. Mm-hmm. And I saw that I was supposed to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. at the time, I had um, a husband that um, could support us if it didn't work. And then mm-hmm. it turned out that he left his job to work for me because it was so successful. But then we got divorced and I moved down here. And um, But it, the challenge is, is what I thrive on. The reason I left general medicine is because I got bored with everything being the same. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I never have a day that's boring, I'm ever. Nice. In fact, one of the things I tell people is my life is like a roller coaster. And sometimes I say, okay, God, can I just get off for a few minutes and stand in line <laughs> before we start going up and down and twist and twirl? Right. But I, I love it. Exactly what you're, what you're talking about. I'm going to go to the underwater treadmill because mm-hmm. so many dog lovers now use them. Uh, they go to their physical therapists and veterinarians and they use them. So you were the one, you mm-hmm. were the person who created the first underwater treadmill. Like this should be a Nobel Prize kind of like <laughs> stature here because I, I, you know, everyone takes them almost for granted, right? That they exist. Think about this. When I came to the, the company, I researched and, and saw all the different human underwater treadmills. I'm like, they have them for horses. They have them for horses before mm-hmm. they had them for humans. I'm like, why can't we have these for dogs? They laughed at me. Mm-hmm. Why would you want this? Nobody is going to pay mm-hmm. to put a dog on an underwater treadmill. That's absolutely ridiculous. Now they sell a lot more ones for dogs than they do for humans. I kind of, uh, with, with my first dog, Sky, he... When he was older, I was going to I underwater treadmill with him. And my wish was that my second dog, my dad's dog, is going to learn to water walk in the water. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he did. But he became absolutely obsessed with water. <laughs> I can't get him out of water anywhere. Like if there's a body of water. And he's a border collie. He just goes in and he likes to walk and fish. Mm-hmm. So you are also an acupuncturist. You're a chiropractor. I know that... Some colleagues and some people are skeptical about these disciplines. I've been always working alongside with a chiropractor and a physical therapist because we weren't taught. And uh, I knew that if I have other team members who are going to take that over and on, it's like working in a team. Right? I sometimes feel like we're like pods of dolphins playing and, and, and figuring out. Mm-hmm. So how did you navigate the perceptions of some colleagues and some people that what you're doing is not that important or necessary or doesn't work? A couple things there. One, yes, um, I do acupuncture. I can feel the point. So I have the basic knowledge in my head. I'm certified in all of that. Mm-hmm. Yet, I feel that I get really good results. One of my, my gifts is to feel energy and where it's like stagnant or where it's um, deficient and move the energy to get there. And then with chiropractic, yes, I'm certified in chiropractic. And that gives me legitimacy. So 
courses, I've taken courses or have learned things. And again, a lot of knowledge has come to me intuitively or Mm -hmm. innately. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, what is that? And I try to put a term to label it. So um, though I say chiropractic, because that's something that people can picture. Mm -hmm. I do sacral occipital technique, cranial sacral, myofascial work, Mm -hmm. uh, listening, Bowen, osteopathy or ants, uh, animal normalization techniques. I'm learning how to use a tuning fork to to release the fascia. Again, always, always, always learning. There's so many things that go into that, but you can't say all of that to a client. You can say, I'm going to do chiropractic. It's not Mm -hmm. exactly what you expect. It's manual therapy, manipulation, and we're going to get amazing results. And when they see getting amazing results, they don't care what it's called. Yes. And you know, it's like, um, it's like music. Sometimes people expect that uh, you'll have some sort of cookbook recipe for how to handle each individual patient. Mm -hmm. I know that it is not like that, that it's like a painting or, Mm -hmm. or a song or some sort of frequency. You know, many people are open to energy medicine and, and understand somehow how the body works. But sometimes you can't really explain what it feels like where there's a congested spinal segment or musculature or the fascia is stuck or whatever you call it, like we all call it differently. How do you describe it? You know, I, I, when, I, when I examine the spine, I, I usually say, you know, it feels like there's a breeze or there's thick, muggy, muggy weather. Right, something like how do you feel it and describe it? Because I'm really curious to see how you perceive it. If if you can dis- describe that sensation. So I am one science based, right? So I always try to pull. I'm, I'm a research nerd, mm-hmm. so I always try to pull research that goes along with or negates what I'm thinking, so that I can have validation for it. Mm-hmm. Two, I'm a visual and kinesthetic learner. So mm-hmm. if someone says I don't understand, blah. I'll say, hey, come here. Or you ask the question, you get to be the Dilbert principal, right? We're going to take you and use you as an example. And everything I have learned is teachable, right? Which is huge. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just trust me on this. It's I want you to feel this. So I'll mm-hmm. say, okay, you want to feel this? Even with my clients, I'll have come feel this in your dog. Feel this now. Let me do this. Now feel it. And I can't tell you, I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody has said, wow, if I get down on the floor, will you treat me too? Or with what you did, would that help my hand or my knee or my hip or my whatever? Yeah. And then, you know, I love the, the idea. I love the idea that he's tuning forks because I I always, <laughs> I've been telling sometimes my clients that uh, that our animals and us are like the, like the tuning forks that we actually start resonating on the same frequency. <laughs> we start having the same problems and so on. And it's just so fascinating. And I, I feel like there is like thousand lifetimes of learning. Mm-hmm. I know that a few years ago you were recognized as the holistic practitioner of the year by the American Holistic yes. Veterinary Medical Association. That speaks to your impact on our profession. How does uh, such recognition shape or influence your future work? Honestly, I thought it was cool and then it went away. <laughs> so, right. So to me, it's not about an award. It's about what can I learn to help fix the dog? What can mm-hmm. I learn to help the dog and then help others help dogs? It's the, all mm-hmm. my big thing mm-hmm. is the ripple effect. Literally my tagline is empowering people, optimizing pets, right? I want to help people help pets because if I, if I work one day, I can have 10 dogs. If I can teach 10 people to do what I do, that's a hundred dogs a day. And the yes. fact that I think I have lectured to thousands or by this time, maybe a hundred thousand, who knows? Um, I, it's just so heartwarming to me when I have people, I was just at a ACVSMR meeting. So I'm board certified in sports medicine mm-hmm. and rehabilitation. And we just had our first meeting, which was great. And I had somebody who was an intern from Poland 20 something years ago. And she's like, oh my God, Laura, you changed my life. And I hear that. And to me, it's not, I did anything. It's that, oh my God, my influence is now helping dogs in Poland, right? And how cool is that, that I have dogs in Taiwan and Korea Amazing. and China and all these pe- places that are getting helped because of something small that I did so long ago. It's, it's, it's such a blessing. I love the idea of empowering people. 
I love the idea that you don't really care what others think at this point and <laughs> just kind of like do what you love to do. It's inspiring. And, you know, I've, I've kind of felt like that too. Like, but I would like to tackle some of the challenges that we, that many dog lovers have, and that's aging mm-hmm. and mobility for their dogs. And with aging dog population and increasing concerns about mobility and arthritis for each of those dogs, what do you see mm-hmm. the most pressing challenge? How how does your work address it in a you know in a more concrete way? I know that we can we don't have hours, but still, like you could give me a little bit of a summary, and everyone else who's listening. So the typical thing that we see in people that not, are not influenced by me is. My dog is getting older. They're laying around more. They're less active. They're less active. They atrophy or their muscles get smaller and weaker. They get at, they atrophy. So their joints are more unstable. Mm -hmm. They're more unstable. So they hurt more. So they're less active and we spiral down until Fluffy can't get up anymore and we have to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And I have been so blessed to be able to take that spiral and turn it upside down on its head and say, I feel better. I feel better. So I'm more active. I'm more Mm -hmm. active. So I get stronger. My tendons, my ligaments, my muscles are all more strong. So now I'm happier. So I move more. So getting rid of pain and then strengthening with both endurance exercise and target exercise takes that spiral and spirals it up. And though I work with a lot of geriatric dogs, so I have to say goodbye at some point, Mm -hmm. I have gotten so many letters and phone calls saying, Oh my God, Lori, you gave me two more years with my dog. Three more, you know, I thought I was going to lose him even six months and my dog was fluffy again. He wasn't just the lump in the corner that I had to put out several times a day. He was my buddy. We got to go for walks again. We got to do things we shared. Um, it's, it's so heartwarming. It's priceless. There's, there's no it dollar is. amount that can be assigned to it. And, you know, I, I totally understand uh, what the downwards pyro looks like and it happens not only in dogs but also in people and i'm sure that uh, through their dogs people learn about how to look after their injuries after their weaknesses and instead of getting injured and stopping doing everything and not rehabilitating or not not strengthening people actually think that when they get injured or their dogs get injured that they have to stop doing everything and wait until things recover but that actually is not true correct well, obviously, if you have a fractured bone yeah, you course. have to be yeah. non weight bearing right but most of the time i mean think about it There's studies in horses that show that rather than putting them in a a stall for six months, Mm -hmm. just hand walking them, right? Don't let them go wild, Yes. but just walking them is helpful. Mm -hmm. Even if you have back surgery, walking straight is helpful, right? Again, you don't want to be twisting and turning, but it's helpful. Think about humans. You have heart surgery, right? You have back surgery. Within 24 hours, you're up and walking, right? You may need assistance, but the same thing with dogs. You know, people say, oh, cage cage rest. I'm like, ah, that's like the worst thing to me. Even if you're just putting them in a room where they can't jump on anything, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So that they can get up and move around a little bit. But, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the difficult part that there is such lack of education in veterinary Mm -hmm. medicine, even in human medicine. Like how many patients, you know, you, you go in the hospital and people are lying in their beds, even though they wouldn't have to. If right. they have, I don't know, hepatitis or if they have kidney stones or something like that, they don't need to lie in bed. But right. we have this idea that hospitals, like in the Second World War, are still like, you know, rows of beds and people lying in them. And and it drives me crazy. And the same thing happens with, with dogs. Well, even just as, as dogs age, getting, you know, I have some clients that come in and their dog is very weak and frail. Mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, five times a day, get up and go to the mailbox. Yes. Right. Set your phone. Everybody has a phone. Set a timer. On these times, we're going to get up. We, you, you may just walk around the house. You may go outside and walk around the outside of the house. And we're going to slowly build them up inside their comfort zone so that they don't get hurt. Mm-hmm. And yet, that's working on their muscles, their tendons, their ligaments, their brain. I think exercise and diet are so, so, so important for all of our patients. What do you think is the most overlooked factor in preventing arthritis in dogs or just generally the you know the 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 aging process but maybe arthritis why don't we just focus on arthritis and inflammation of the joints being overweight right Mm -hmm. so we know white fat makes leptin and other chemicals that Mm -hmm. can create inflammation and unfortunately when we look at 
you know, it used to be our, our scale of dogs that were lean to overweight was like a one to five and they had to make it a one to nine. What we see as normal 20, 30 years ago was obese, right? I look at my athletes. So I always, I have, I have it broken down for weight as are you athlete weight or pet weight? And pets don't have to be athlete weight, right? But think about if you've got like a runner or a swimmer, right? An Olympic athlete, they're a different weight and body mass than body your average fat, person. Yes. And body and fat as well. Yes. Right? So you have that. But then I have clients who are like, Lori, my vet is telling me that my dog is too skinny. And I'm like, no, they're an athlete, right? That's They're lean. They're going to live longer have less metabolic issues and allergy issues and all kinds of other things because they don't have that inflammation. So that that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing would be exercise. Exercise is so, so, so important for both the brain and the body. And longevity. And, and longevity. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, showing and, again and, again. and insulin, insulin function, mm-hmm. and production, and all that stuff. And I'm not kidding, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. <laughs> Yesterday I went to coffee shop. And this is this is very strange. I went to the coffee shop and I wrote a blog on obesity. And even though I actually because I've been, you know, I've been teaching my clients to feed natural diets and, and, and focus on nutrition and metabolism and, and, and a slightly different part of health well being, but obviously it all is connected. Just yesterday I finished writing the blog. And you're telling me this, and so I feel really glad, but also perplexed because Living and practicing in Vancouver, I, 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 I did not really see the, the obese pets very often. Mm-hmm. So when my team comes and says, Peter, people are asking about obesity and what to do about overweight uh, dogs. And, and I'm like, I don't think it's a big problem. And now you're coming <laughs> and saying, no, this is a real big problem. So I'm, I'm glad that, that there's some sort of alignment. It is really beautiful how the universe works. Well, and don't you think, Peter, that the people who come see you may have learned from you and have better knowledge and take maybe better care of their pets? And so they, you're not seeing the obese dogs. And if you were to look outside of your little bubble of the people that aren't listening to your wise words, that you may see it more? You know, I don't necessarily see them as wise words. It's, it's actually a little, it's a little too lofty uh, for me. But, uh, I, you know how it is. Like when we are working, when we are in our world, we don't really see that. And I, you know, I can see the impact that you've had. I may not see as much of an impact that I've had, but you know, I do believe it. And one time I had an aha moment when I went for a walk in Vancouver. I go, oh my goodness, I've seen most of the dogs have had harness as opposed to collars. Maybe mm-hmm. the 10, 15, 20 years of really like saying harnesses, harnesses mm-hmm. made a difference, right? After a while. So this is a message for all of us that we should never stop, even though it seems like we may have not made as much of a difference. Suddenly it's there. But I would like to go back to your work. Um, um, Can you give me a story where you've been able to detect early detection of arthritis and inflammation, and it truly changed uh, the dog's life? Well, and I'm board certified in sports medicine and rehabilitation for dogs. Okay. So I see 99.9% dogs. Cats and physio, I don't really know. Obviously, they need it. Mm-hmm. They need it. They have a lot of back pain, right? Yes. Yeah. But- and I always tell people, if your dog has trouble going up the stairs and you have to help them, it's work. If your dog has trouble getting into the car and onto the bed, it's work. If your cat stops jumping on the counters, you don't notice. Or if you do notice, you don't want it to change. right? <laughs> but, but they're doing it because they don't yeah. feel as good. Yeah. Um, again, things that I have learned a very, oh, I just lectured on this. I did a, a webinar on this and I just lectured on this at HVMA. Oh, and by the way, at HVMA last week, I was keynote speaker, which was my first time being a keynote speaker. So it was very, very exciting. I was home with my family. I'm sad that I couldn't go because I'm the other side of the pond and I have to make, make a point of flying over for these events a little more. How did it go? Oh, it was great. I, uh, my keynote speech, um, there were 350 people at the conference and over 250 people were there. And I would say I had at least 50 people afterwards come up and say, uh-huh. I helped change their life. Uh-huh. So that was really touching and amazing. Mm-hmm. So it went mm-hmm. really well. But back to inflammation, because this is so, so important. 
80% of orthopedic surgeries in dogs are for Cushing injuries, Mm -hmm. 80%. So it's just, Mm -hmm. you know, when I graduated vet school in 92, we would see in a six doctor practice, we would see maybe one Cushing Mm -hmm. a month. That same practice sees multiple a day, right? It's just dogs used to have a traumatic injury and then, you know, like jump to catch their Frisbee, come down wrong and tear their cruciate. Now it is, they're running across the yard, they scream, they lift up a leg. And we know it's not from trauma, it's from inflammation. Mm-hmm. And degeneration. The cruciate. Degeneration. And degeneration. Yes, yes. So cruciate means cross. So we have the cruciate ligaments inside the knee and it's inside the knee, which means if there's inflammation in the fluid around that, that's pop, 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 popping little, little tendrils. And we can't even feel that until enough of those tentacles pop that we can see, okay, now I have some instability in here. But the inflammation's there way, way, way before. And I've come up with a way to find it, to prevent it from continuing to have that pop, pop, pop until it tears. Well, I can't wait to tell, can you tell me what it is? Or can you yeah, tell Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, can you hold on for one second? I'm a Absolutely. visual learner. So I'm gonna yes. grab a knee. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Do you have your aids? I do. Great. Let's go for it. Okay. So here's a knee, right? So here's the femur. Here's the little patella inside, right? And then inside you can see the cruciate. Mm-hmm. The kneecap for everyone. Here is what it looks like when there's inflammation. Mm-hmm. So I can show that up there, right? So we have inflammation. There's a cruciate mm-hmm. inside. Here's the mm-hmm. fibula, the tibia. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? That if I'm looking for crepitus or grinding, if I traction the joint, I'm not going to find it. But if mm-hmm. I compress the joint and then mm-hmm. put it in motion, if there's grinding, then it's, oh, I'm going to feel it better, right? Yes. So in order for me to have grinding, it means the joint fluid has to have thinned, right? Thick, healthy joint fluid is like motor oil. It smooths everything and everything's yes. good. Yes. But when it thins, it allows that cartilage to grind, which creates a lot of trauma and more inflammation. And then it's one of those cycles that can lead to a cruciate injury. So the most sensitive way I have found to find if there's inflammation is, again, here's my patella. If I put my hand and push the patella into the femur and then bend and extend, Mm -hmm. I can feel that grinding. Yes, yes. That tells me that joint fluid is thin and there's inflammation. <laughs> I injured my shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But even pet parents could do this. Put their, their palm of their hand against the patella and bend and extend. Yes. Right? Flex and extend. Straighten and bend. Mm-hmm. And if you feel any kind of in there, that there's inflammation. Right? And it's that inflammation that's going to cause a trauma to that cruciate. And it's not like, oh, my God, my dog's going to tear a cruciate. But it's. I need to get on some kind of chondroprotectants. I need to get on the right supplements, omega-3s, something with glucosamine or perna muscles in it, um, and maybe boswellia, you know, whatever it is that works for your dog to get rid of that inflammation so we can stop that process and rebuild that cartilage and rebuild, you know, the strengthening of the ligaments so that we don't have that problem mm-hmm. and we don't tear it all the way. You know, I was actually, once you start naming the ingredients, um, I'm going to confess something that I haven't really said anywhere. Mm-hmm. I have uh, I have an amazing, well, I think it's amazing. We'll see. But I, I, I have a fermented formula of for mobility that is coming out um, in the next few months. Yay! And I've worked on it for probably two or three years. Like it's just been a really hard, long journey because I, I yeah. So anyway, all the three ingredients that he named were there and more. So I was going, I was nice. counting, I was kind of holding my breath thinking, okay, I hope that Larry will, um, that all the ingredients are in there. I actually love the methods that he showed and everyone can use it. But then what do we do when we recognize the inflammation that we go through all the different steps, right? Like right. on the so- physical, physical side, like obviously there's nutritional side, the metabolic side, and, you know, overall whole body, full body side, but there's the, the physical therapy side as well. Like what do you do on, on that level? If I find inflammation, if I feel that grind, we make sure they're on a chondroprotectant, a cartilage protector, mm-hmm. right? Chondroprotectant. Mm-hmm. If that's not enough. So 12 weeks later, Mm-hmm. It's not all better. Then we put them on a polyglycosaminoglycan, right? Mm-hmm. So like an Adequan. Yes. If that doesn't make them better, 
you know, then we have to think about, do we start a laser program? Something mm-hmm. that we know is going to decrease the inflammation. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, as soon as we find it, we start exercises that are going to, when we look at that knee, right, we have our patella tendon. So our quadriceps come down here, mm-hmm. right? Here's our patella. Here's a patella tendon. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. our ligaments on the side. We have other tendons that come around. The gastro comes up this way. We can strengthen all of that to help stabilize the knee so we don't have as much fear force. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. When we test to see if there's a cruciate injury, we either have our fingers here and we say, can I move that tibia forward? Or we have our fingers here and we bend the hock. You can't see me. Bend the hock and we see if that tibia is going to come forward. Mm-hmm. And that's checking the cruciate. Of course. Right. So the job of the cruciate is to prevent a shear force and to prevent rotation. So if we can strengthen everything to help decrease the shear force and the rotation, we're helping that cruciate in a safe environment heal rather than Mm -hmm. continue to be in an environment that is putting pressure on it. So simple, simple exercises can help stabilize it tremendously. I love it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it makes so much sense. I'll compare it to a house. Like you have a house and you put the, the detectors of the different of the gas leak and other issues like you know the electrical wiring of the breakers and everything and then when there's a problem we fix it before the house catches on fire mm-hmm. because what we do in veterinary medicine often we go okay the house caught on fire let's let's rebuild it and it's sometimes very difficult so this is this is like i know that so many dog lovers who are going to listen to this are going to be excited beyond yeah, it's just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And it's not just the injury. It's the injury, and then they go through surgery. Oh. And even if you have a healthy joint and you go in surgically, you're going to get arthritis, right? So we can slow that, slow or stop that whole progression so that they don't have problems later on in life. But, you know, then we also have to look at the sources of inflammation and why it happens in the body and, and all that. It's just like this is holistic medicine where you look at the whole and you yes. put all the pieces. And when people collaborate and go, OK, I can help with this. And another person goes, and I can help with this. And then suddenly we have a robust plan that really yes. makes a difference, huge difference. You know, everyone who is like, oh, my dog has, you know, some crepitus or my dog, you know, I'm worried about this. Something that is so simple that um, anybody can do is if your dog is standing and you just pick up one leg, they have to stabilize on the other three legs. Mm -hmm. Then you put that Mm -hmm. one down and you pick up the next one and then you pick up the front one and then you pick up the other one and you do that and you just go around a couple times. That Mm -hmm. is working on all of the muscles that are, you might even see the muscles shaking, right? Strengthening everything. In a, in a manner that there is no shear force, no rotation force, no compression force, you're strengthening everything. Mm-hmm. And you can do that with a 16-week-old puppy or a 16 or 18-year-old dog, and it will just help them. Or 60-year-old men like me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, think about this. That's like when you brush your teeth, right? I always tell – when I lecture, I tell people, in the morning when you brush your teeth, stand on just your left leg. In the night when you brush your teeth, stand on just your right mm-hmm. leg. Because you're doing the same thing with your knees. Because in humans, the knee is the number one place we get arthritis because we're on it all the time. And, you know, the funny part is that people think that uh, when when dogs and and humans get stiff, that the thing that they should do is uh, stretching. And they completely forget about strengthening, which is, I think, more important because it stabilizes stabilizes the joint and, you know, builds up the muscles. And also metabolically, muscles are super important. And in the whole body metabolism and health and immune system function, and, you know, preventing insulin resistance and all that. I would like to move to the topic of aging. Yes. Because we all know that we can delay it, but mm-hmm. we cannot prevent it from happening. Mm-hmm. How can dog lovers best prepare mentally and emotionally for the mobility time challenges that their dogs face? For how can they prepare? Exercise. So seriously, exercise, can I nerd out on you a little bit? Because I love research. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So there's studies in mice that show that um, when mice are just in a box, right, in their little cage versus in an enriched environment where they have things to do, they live longer. Mm-hmm. They did a older mouse study 
where they took mice for 45 days and they put them in an enriched environment and their brain increased uh, by 15%, the hippocampus, the part that's memory and learning. And they had over 40,000 more Mm -hmm. neurons, right? Mm -hmm. When they took these mice and they had a wheel where they can walk on the wheel and do things, they had five times, this isn't 45 days, this isn't 10 months, but only 10 months. They had five times the size hippocampus as the one as, as the mice that were just in a box. The exercise of like walking, swimming, things like that increased the number of, of neurons in their brain and then learning things and doing targeted exercise, which is, you know, one of my passions actually increased the life expectancy of each neuron, which is how they could get so many more neurons mm-hmm. because they're getting more and then they're living mm-hmm. longer. It, besides, you know, everything else, it works in the brain. We know in the body that muscle, as we age, we lose type two muscle fibers. So there's type one, type two. In dogs, there's also type two C, type two dog, mm-hmm. but they're mm-hmm. all very similar to type two. We know that as we age, we lose type two muscles just by getting older. but how do we lose type one muscle is disuse. So if we losing type two and then we lay around, now we're losing everything. Can we actually make a little pause here and just explain? So type yeah. one is the fast twitch muscle, right? The white white fiber. Type one is your posture and your endurance. So you have a lot of type one if you're like a marathon runner, right? You're lean. Okay, okay. So I mixed it up. Like it was physiology was uh, 30 years ago. So type one is the 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 slow twitch muscle fiber yep we're just going to keep going it's endurance and type two is fast right yeah that's your your um gym rat right the people that are super strong so their muscles get really big but they fatigue quickly and of course what's the best is cross training when you work both i've I've read a few uh, articles and listened to a few podcasts and blogs and research studies um they say that the best exercise for us to prevent aging and maybe for dogs as well is not necessarily like high high super high intensity but the intensity where you can't really talk easily where you get a little out of breath and and do that a lot obviously high intensity interval training is important too so for dogs what would that be like where would where would they would it be it wouldn't be just walking in the city like you know like slow right like it would be a little right more. you need to actually change their breathing pattern mm mm-hmm. I always tell people, if your dog wants to go out and sniff, great, and then walk. And that's, we're going to go, and we're going to go, and we're going to go. At a fast pace, and maybe a little At a fast pace. Yeah, a little uphill. And hiking. So hiking on trails is is really. Yeah, hiking's great, because then you have uneven surfaces, so your brain is constantly going, and your body's going, okay, we're going to strengthen everything that's supporting everything, so that we don't trip and fall. That's huge. So go ahead, because I interrupted you. I we oh, okay. We, we lose type 2 muscle fibers just from getting older. But we can, we can increase our type 1 muscle fibers, mm-hmm. right? Because that's not affected by age. And we can transfer, right? So if you use your type 1 muscle fibers a lot like type 2, mm-hmm. they can transfer and become like type 2, mm-hmm. right? Or vice versa. So they can more basically in one, one or the other. Yeah. Oh, wow. So by doing our endurance work and then doing our targeted exercises, we're strengthening everything so that we're more stable and that we lose muscle less fast or we lose muscle slower. So everyone has sarcopenia, right? So that is when the muscle gets smaller. It's muscle loss, right? It's muscle loss, right? First it turns, um, it gets replaced by fat. So that we don't see a change in circumference, but we see a change in strength. And then we see it uh, is replaced with fibrous tissue or scar tissue, right? So that's when even if you were you were super strong when you're young, you get smaller, 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 and you lose significant strength. So if you look at like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He used to be like huge chest. He's older now. So he shrunk, even though he continues to work out. But if he started... There's studies that show that if you start when you're younger, you can maintain much longer than if you start when you're older. So though I have exercises that I say are great for older dogs, I recommend it for puppies, right? So let's get them strong now so they have more so that as they age and they lose, Mm -hmm. right? If you're going to lose 25% of 25 versus 25% of 100, 
you're much better if you start with 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? That's really, it totally makes sense. Now, muscles also, logically, they they contribute to reducing obesity. Mm -hmm. But it also brings me to one area that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and that is muscle loss due to neutering male dogs. Mm. Because I've had both dogs, both of my dogs have been neutered. Uh, one, because it used to be done, and second, because he was a cryptorchid. And uh, I definitely see the effect on that. And I've been even thinking about um, possibly doing or starting hormone replacement therapy to a certain degree to see how he's going to do. What is your opinion about all this? Um, have you seen muscle loss and neutering being being a problem, like or on the physiological level and mobility and strength level and and the gradual deterioration of, of, of um, their muscles and joints and so on. So I can tell you again, I worked with a lot of police dogs for, you know, 15 years mm -hmm. and they will not, um, the people who train the police dogs will not neuter them mm -hmm. because of the loss of muscle and the loss of drive mm -hmm. when they're neutered, right? Mm -hmm. So my dog right now is neutered because I got them from the Humane Society, right? Mm -hmm. I always try to save dogs. It's mm -hmm. what my, where my heart goes to. Mm -hmm. But if I were to get one from a breeder, unless it was a medical issue, I wouldn't spay or neuter a dog. There's studies that show that, you know, there's multiple cancers that increase. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, 20 years ago, we looked at a osteosarcoma study in greyhounds, right? Because it's so prominent in the greyhounds. And what mm -hmm. they found was it wasn't sex, it wasn't weight, it was how tall they were. So the taller they were, the more likely they were to have bone cancer. Well, what makes those dogs taller is early spay and neuter so that they don't have the correct hormones to monitor to, to change that so they get taller. And then they're the ones who get the osteosarcs. And also fast growth from uh, feeding processed food and high density food. Mm. I call it the over fertilized plant syndrome, right? Like they just basically mm -hmm. have nutrients that are really calorie dense um, diets. Like they eat more because the food is dehydrated. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I definitely see that too. And especially early neuters, it's even worse, right? Mm -hmm. Because these dogs don't develop and so on. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge. Yes. We'll continue with aging. Are there any subtle behavioral or physical signs that most pet parents miss when it comes to aging and issues and problems? So there's, there's always the cognitive dysfunction, right? So things like increased anxiety, not sleeping as well, more pacing, um, more vocalizing, some apathy, right? Somebody comes home and they're like, yeah, hi. Instead of like, mom, you're home, right? That kind of thing. Um, those are, are some of the things we see where their brain isn't working as well. And mm -hmm. it can progress to the point of, you know, going to the wrong side of the door or ro not recognizing people. Uh, but there's so many things before that. And it, um, I have a Mastiff mix. He's like Mastiff Boxer. Again, Humane Society dog, right? That literally can put his front feet up on a ball. And walk it 40 feet and then 40 feet back, right? He can sit up and bag and do high fives. You know, and people say, you have an almost 14-year-old dog who's a 95-pound dog. That's like almost unheard of. And it's because when we find things, we fix them, right? So it's looking for things and then, again, strengthening to, to help their brain and their body function better, right? Mm -hmm. So things that people could look for. Again, the signs of cognitive dysfunction, um, they can look for decreased activity, right? Oh, he wanted to turn around on the walk or... They don't, they refuse to walk, right? Or they stop, they don't want to walk. Right. Or think that their dog is stubborn, but they may, or they sniff more, right? Like they suddenly default. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're changing the subject. Yeah, 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 yeah. They go like, oh, I can't do that. So let's do this. So, wait, so you said you have a border collie, right? A border collie. Because I work on a lot of border collies, because I work on a lot of athletes. Sometimes they will lick you nice and slow and say, I love you. And sometimes they lick you faster. And that's like, you're doing something to me. I'm going to change the subject. Oh, look, I love you. So you can't do this to me. Right. So for <laughs> me, that's a border yawns, collie. Actually, my dog <laughs> sends calming signals when he doesn't want, uh, when something is really difficult, he yawns. Yeah. He is, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, he's from Prague originally. I, I was looking for rescue border collie for probably about three or four months. And there was a time when I had to get a dog because we, it's a long story, but because of travel and stuff, I basically live in two places. And so I was willing to fly to Oregon to get a rescue border collie puppy because I wanted to have a puppy. I, I have a sleepwalking disorder and I sleepwalk through glass door oh. and every, and I almost died. So every dog that I have, we trained for my sleepwalking, turning on lights and catching me when I walk away, away from the bed and so on. So we needed to have a puppy for, for the training, but, but there was no rescue border collie anywhere. So I was willing to fly to Oregon, it took them like a week to approve me for the adoption. And I said, I'm flying in. Can you make sure that the dog is there when I arrive? Because I'm flying from Europe. I said, no reservations. So then I ended up with the dog from breeder. Actually, the lady was a tech and so on. And I don't even know why I started talking about it. But yeah, so my dog is a bohemian. That's what I wanted to say because I'm from the Czech Republic. And in Latin, Czech equals bohemia. And so, uh, yeah, my dog is really silly. He's a border collie. But when you meet him, and one day maybe you'll meet him if we connect in a physical world, he acts like a golden retriever. He fishes. He does all the water <laughs> stuff. And he hunts. <laughs> so nice. I now, I would like you to tell me about your dogs before we go on, because I think it's important for everyone to know who your dogs are. Uh, tell us about them. So I have a almost in, on, in February, he'll be 14, Mastiff um, Boxer something mix. Inspiring. Inspi who is just, I, I love him because in my exercise course, we I show all the exercises with Sid, my um, five-year-old Feist, who is brilliant and amazing. He's one of the few dogs in the world that can actually walk on a round ball and he can walk it forward, backwards, sideways, spin and twirl. Oh my um, goodness. I didn't teach him this because it was a trick. I taught him this because I wanted him so solid that he wouldn't have a shoulder injury, a knee injury, a back injury, an iliopsoas injury, all the things that I see day in and day out. But when in the exercise course, we teach everything with Sid who does it perfectly. And then we teach everything. And then we do the same thing with Ollie, who I love him dearly and is dumb as a box of rocks. Right. <laughs> I, I, because he makes every mistake. He does everything wrong. But you learn from that, right? You love him equally, right? He's oh, my child. God. I love him. I yeah. love him. He drools all over me. and mm. yeah, But he's so sweet. He's so, so yeah. sweet. It's, you know, there's the, that's the beauty of that, right? Like, my first dog was a soldier. Like, he was like a clock. And Pax is like, yeah, he's a bohemian. But he goes like, oh, there's another dog. I can cross the road. There's another, there's another dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when he's among children, like I took him to first grade uh, that my friend teaches. And uh, he was like in seven heaven. Other dogs would be terrified. And, you know, the more the better. The 20 kids on top of him. And he's mm -hmm. just like. This is so cool. That's right? awesome. So what house modification do you recommend when dogs start aging or when it comes to car travel? Or Can you give us any recommendations for aging dogs? Yeah. So stairs going up onto the bed. Um, I have some clients who take their beds off of the, um, the stand. Yes. So it's just their mattress or the box spring and mattress mm -hmm. so the dogs can still get in the bed. Mm -hmm. If you need to, you know, use a ramp outside you can have a ramp going into your car to help them mm -hmm. get into the car there's a product called a help them up which is a front harness and a back harness and it connects and there's mm -hmm. a handle on each yes. so that if you need to help you've got that, I've um, seen that. There's, yep there's things that if they're sliding that you can spray on their feet like show foot or there's paw friction um, there's socks things that so they're not sliding and Instead of doing that, you can do that to get them through it, but something as simple as side steps, right? Because most older dogs, if they fall, they fall with either their front or back out to the side. Mm -hmm. So rather than just putting something grippy on their feet, if you strengthen the muscles that hold their legs in, mm -hmm. then they don't have that problem. And I'm sure it's in your courses as well. Yes. Lovely. Yep. Yep. In the world where everyone is trying to fix mobility in dogs but not everyone is successful have you noticed any misconceptions uh when it comes to exercise yes what mistakes are people making 
The mis- biggest mistakes people make is, um, well, one would be weekend warrior syndrome. Mm-hmm. I work all day. I come home. My dog's there. I ignore him. I feed him, right? He goes out. That's it. And then weekend comes and we're going to run a marathon, mm-hmm. right? We call it weekend warrior syndrome. And if the dog is not getting any exercise all week, and then on the weekends you're pushing him, mm-hmm. he's much more likely to get injured. So it's much better to have a little bit of exercise. Um, my recommendation is walk your dog at least 25 minutes, five days a week, right? And that can include the weekend. But if you did Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm-hmm. and then Saturday and Sunday, at least it's not nothing, 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 bam, because there's lots of studies that show that that kind of weekend warrior syndrome significantly increases um, in- injuries. The other thing is warm up and cool down. A muscle is much less likely to get injured mm-hmm. if it's warmed up. So mm-hmm. the, the blood flow is brought in, the fat, the things that it needs to be able to lengthen and contract, right? Mm-hmm. So it to be able to work increases as that blood flow increases. So spending even just two to five minutes before something strenuous and then two to five minutes at the end to get rid of the pyruvate. Uh, humans build lactic acid, dogs build pyruvate. So it's a, a different chemical, but it still can increase the chance mm-hmm. of injury. So having that warm up and that cool down is huge. Mm-hmm. And if mm-hmm. you think about an athlete, they're always going to warm up before they, right? You see the, the football players doing all these stretches and jumping and doing things. That's warming up their muscles so that when they push to the limits, their, their muscles aren't cold. And that they're not as likely to get injured. Of course, yes, and and also the right energy resources have to be mobilized, right? And ATP Correct. and uh, NAD plus, and yes. there's like rep cycle, energy cycle has to has to kickstart, right? Yes. What do you think of let's say frisbee throwing, uh, ball throwing? You know, dogs pretty much walking walls. Sometimes you see in some of these uh, videos. What do you think of this high intensity uh, exercise? Like, what is your opinion? So my kids played football. My, uh, my sons competed uh, high levels of wakeboarding. Uh, I don't know if you know what wakeboarding is. Yes, it's like yes. snowboarding, but behind yes. a boat, yes. right? Yes, of course. And I always said, right, you get strong, you play hard, and if you get hurt, mom will fix you, right? Yes. It's just what we do. So I have no problem with high-intensity activity. Some people, like you have a border collie. You tell a border collie, oh, we're going to go for a five-minute walk <laughs> twice a day. He's going to be out of his head, right? He's going to be like, I got to do something. So you have a breed like a Malinois or a, a breed that is just high drive. They need to do something mm-hmm. or they're going to become destructive or they're going to break down chewing or they're misbehaving to say, I need to do something the same way if you take a athlete. You take a Michael Jordan or a um, you know, football player, or any of those guys, and you try to say, "Okay, you're just you're just going to sit here. Something bad is going to happen." So I have no problem with high intensity exercise as long as you're strengthened beforehand, and then get treated if small injuries afterwards. <laughs> I used to recommend, and I and it still can be found in some of my blogs that you know the high intensity exercise should be dosed and should not mm-hmm. be like people should not be sitting in the park uh, or talking and just chucking the ball for 45 minutes like what is the right amount of exercise like you know when it comes to this high intensity training and then hiking what is the right exercise for dogs i know that it varies so whether you have a you know border collie or a little chihuahua or Mm -hmm. friendship or something like that um what is what is the right exercise so think about humans right so again if we take a um My niece is a collegiate gymnast and she is in training. So either in college, in study Mm -hmm. hall, a a tutor, or in the gym from 7 a.m. to 9 o'clock at night, five days a week. You can't start there. She started when she was four, right? Now she's 18, right? So you, and you take a dog, say a hunting dog, and they're going to be out in the field for six hours. They have to be prepared for that. But it takes a lot of preparing to get them there, mm-hmm. right? And you can't say, oh, we're just going to do a little bit, and then I'm going to expect a lot of you here. So every dog is different, and it depends upon what their job is. If you take a dog that's used to herding, and then you have to mm-hmm. run with the horses mm-hmm. and round up the cattle mm-hmm. or the sheep or whatever, it's the same thing. You have to build them up. So there's not one answer. It's what is their job, and how do we prepare them to do that job? A skier will train differently than the gymnast and uh, mm-hmm. and the swimmer will 
will train differently again and triathlete will train differently. You know, you were, you mentioned the weekend warrior syndrome mm -hmm. and that kind of made me think of the fair weather warrior as well. I see many dogs, uh, spring comes and many dogs come up with uh, injuries, mm -hmm. but also with a lot of hot spots and musculoskeletal injuries. You know, I believe strongly, I'm not sure what your opinion is, but Hotspots are basically just an expression of energy congestion and, and, you know, often musculoskeletal issues that just basically reflect in the skin. It's like a signal. You know, what do you recommend um, to people who have dogs um, who, who live in colder climates or rainy climates and their dogs don't get out as often? Is there any way of exercising them? Well, obviously, rain should not be a reason not to take our dogs out. But if there's, let's say, minus 30 degrees Celsius or, you know, uh, really cold temperatures in Fahrenheit, I can't remember what minus 30 is in Fahrenheit. That's okay. It's cold. <laughs> it's cold. It's cold. Yes, it's cold. Yeah. Really cold. It freezes your hair, nose hair. <laughs> so, again, just like a human, um, if you if you want to do your endurance exercises, you, there's places that you can go swimming. There's places you can have a, an in-house treadmill. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of my clients mm -hmm. will have that to run their dogs in the winter. So you have both your endurance exercise and then have exercises that are your targeted exercises. So that's working the brain and the body all mm -hmm. throughout the winter. You don't need a lot of space to be able to have a great exercise program and you don't need a lot of expensive equipment mm -hmm. to be able, you know, I tell people things like um, take the couch cushion off the couch, right? Have them do spin and twirl on the couch cushion. It gives them working on their proprioception, where are my feet? So I'm not stepping off. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm spinning my body and I'm, I'm using all the muscles in my whole spine as well as I have to work on my balance. So I'm working on the stabilizers going up. So there's all kinds of things you can do in your house, even without a gym, or honestly, I believe that we're going to see more and more dog gyms mm -hmm. as we see mm -hmm. more and more people. They don't have kids. Um, you know, people are saying pets are the new kids. Plants are the new pets, which I think is hysterical. Um, and it's just people are going to take better care of their pets and hopefully take better care of themselves. That's a really lovely vision of the future. <laughs> I, 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 I trust that you're right. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have a lot of ideas on how to exercise dogs in-house and how to exercise dogs generally and how to prevent them from aging and how to reduce the chances of inflammation. It is my understanding that you have a ebook that is available mm -hmm. uh, to everyone who is curious. It's called the top five exercises for your geriatric dog. Mm -hmm. Where can people find it? And what is it about? So they can text us at 866-949-0068. Again, if you can repeat that, if you can repeat the number. Yep. So it's 866-949-0068. And the word that you text is E B O O K. So ebook, right? No space. And then it'll ask for your email address and then we send it to your email box. That is fantastic. 25, 26 page book that goes through things to look for. It's five exercises, how to do it, some different options, all kinds of good stuff. And uh, it's available for anyone from anywhere or yep. is the number limited to the US or if people are texting from overseas do they use plus one or i think they i i know i've had people from overseas be able to get it what happens is we get their phone number we th through the text and as long as they can fill in where their email address is they will automatically get the the ebook i suspect that the area code is plus one yes then. for anyone if you don't get the email just make sure that you add plus one it may be just 866 plus the number that we've just <laughs> given you or plus one eight six six and the number that we've given yes and he also of course i do i do so remember i said i have my dog stid who is like amazing mm. when i got him he was 11 months old and i said you have straight knees so that's a cruciate risk. You have a long back. That's a, a back injury risk. You run like the wind. He's, I think he's a feist, which is like a squirrel mm -hmm. hunting dog. Cause mm -hmm. he like run, run, hop, run, run, hop, just like a squirrel. And he screams when he sees a mm -hmm. squirrel. And I said, that's an iliopsoas risk. And he has straight shoulders, right? So I mm -hmm. fell in love with the dog, not how he was put together, mm -hmm. right? So the number one injury is shoulder injuries in dogs that are mm -hmm. active. And I'm like, I need to do something, right? I'm a rehab mama. 
right? I need to do something so that you do not have an injury. So I started doing exercises and then it, it worked really well. I was sharing them with people. Uh, one of my clients who's in Chicago, so we did a um, ultimate exercise challenge and I said, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take videos and I'm going to, you're going to do those exercises. And at 10, Sophia started, she's an agility dog. At 11 and a half, she was the seventh fastest Shelty in bad dog agility, right? So everyone else was like four or five years old. And then here she's, you know, certainly geriatric. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we need to teach more people how to do this. So we put together core and more foundational exercises for your dog. So this is nothing that's going to be compressive to the joints. Um, it's everything that is going to help stabilize the joint, strengthen all the muscles, balance, proprioception, stimulate the brain. Mm-hmm. It's safe enough for a 16 week old puppy and a 16 week old or 16 year old big dog, right? Mm-hmm. It's a progression. So you can't start at the hardest and hurt your dog. You mm-hmm. learn the basics of what is warm up and cool down? What does overheating look like? What should their posture and stance and how they walk look like? So er- I put my heart into all my courses, right? So it's everything you need to know to set you up for success. And then every two weeks you get four exercises. So you can take your dog through the progression so that they can get stronger and stronger. And even your athletes, it's not even just like, here's this exercise. You're going to do sit to stands. It's if this is easy, here's how to make it harder. If this is easy, how to make it harder. Mm -hmm. When to stop. Oh, there's a problem. We need to go to the vet or this is too hard or wow, this is really easy for you. Where do we progress? Really, this really, this is exactly what uh, everyone in our community needs. I, I don't think there is a person who would say, I know it all and I, I don't need this kind of course. I must confess, actually, I thought that I, you know, I, I figured out health and longevity to a greater degree, meaning that, you know, my, I kind of thought, okay, you know, it's all metabolic and nutrition and, and exercise too. But, in, you know, if you do chiropractics and physio and acupuncture, mm-hmm. everything will be fine. And so I get this dog who is incredible. Like, you know, he grew up strong and vigorous and, you know, and beautiful and so on. And he loves water and he loves going to beaches. He likes super fast, running super fast. Like he's like, mm-hmm. he, he is like a line when he runs. Yeah, yeah. And so two two and a half years into it, uh, we went to we went sailing with my sister, and he was running at the beaches and swimming the whole week and so on. And after that, I started seeing a limp, mm-hmm. and I first couldn't really figure it out. Then I realized, you know, it looks like an abscess injury. Like we've obviously did diagnostics and so on, mm-hmm. and um, he's still not perfect. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to take the course and I may mm-hmm. beg you for an advice if I, you know, if I, if I could, um, <laughs> I don't really know why you know, I've been asking for this, this whole year, I need to find someone who really knows how to solve it. And it's really humbling because you know how we're vets and we should know how to solve it. And suddenly we have, we're standing in front of Vichy and I go, Oh my goodness. Like, I don't really know how to solve it. And for me, it's been even more difficult because when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I looked after a horse. I used, I grew up in the, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, you know, horses were owned by the government, but I looked after a horse in a riding club and she had chronic tendinitis and she limped. Mm-hmm. And watching her limping just kind of left a real scar in my heart, basically. That's why I became a vet and I wanted to... And, you know, 30 years later... I have this amazing, happy, strong dog, and I cannot really solve the problem. It's up and down because he likes to chase squirrels and likes to jump mm-hmm. up and likes to do all these things. And suddenly, I can't take him to the beach. He cannot swim because he gets aggravated and all that. So, so can I help you? Of course, he can help me, but I don't really expect you to, you know, do that. Now, but you can give people an idea of what it could possibly look like. So things that I will tell you to deal with an iliopsoas injury is laser. If you have a PEMF machine, that's very beneficial. 
the biggest thing I see people do is they strengthen the psoas in short, right? So if this is the back and this is the front legs and this is the back legs, they may do underwater treadmill, they may do walks, and then they say, go. And what does the dog do? Wah! Right? They fly, which stretches and pulls the iliopsoas and it gets re-injured. And yeah, then you get yeah, more yeah. scar exactly. tissue and more scar exactly. tissue. Exactly. And then yeah. scar tissue contracts and now it's going to be more likely to get injured. What you need to do is fix it and then strengthen it in long. So we do a bunch of exercises, right? Because this way it's strong when it's stretched. And then when he runs and stretches it, it's not going to get re-injured. Well, what I've been doing, actually, I've been having, I've been doing the exercises where he goes on a chair and he stretches and he reaches for a treat and something like Mm -hmm. that. But, you know, I definitely would love to, I'll take the course. It's just something that, uh, that I need to solve. I'm determined beyond anything. I truly believe our animals come into our lives so that we can learn something. And also heal. Yes. And give yourself some grace. I also, because I teach a lot, tell people, you have DVM after your name, not G-O-D, right? So there's, <laughs> we don't we don't know it all. <laughs> of course, I know we don't have it all. But, you know, and I, I think that these situations happen because we can actually relate to our clients so much better. Mm-hmm. We can understand what they're going through. Mm-hmm. I think that there are enough people in the world who are arrogant and I think that it's really important for us to keep our ego in check and be humbled repeatedly. Yes. And also healing through the fact that we deal with challenges, but giving up on them, whether it's our dog's mm-hmm. mobility or whether it's our dog's kidney disease, liver disease, whatever it is, giving up is not the good route. Like we have to be sure that we've done our absolute best. Absolutely. In whatever we do, right? And I so appreciate it. I definitely don't have G-O-D behind my name. <laughs> and do not my mom used to, <laughs> Mama always used to tell me anything worth doing is worth doing right. If you always give 100% of yourself, you'll never have to say, well, what would have happened if I had given a little more? That's beautiful. Yes. I have one last question. Sure. What is your vision for the future when it comes to dogs, dog health, mobility, aging, veterinary rehabilitation? Oh, you you asked a big question because I have a vision. I see it. I literally see what's, and it is, it includes 30 years ago, doggy daycare was like, you board your dog if you go out of town and he's in a cage for two weeks, right? And now it's my dog. I go to work so my dog can go to doggy daycare mm-hmm. and get to play with other dogs, right? And that's big. I foresee that becoming bigger. Just like you take your kids to school, you take your, your dog to places where they can have enrichment. Um, I foresee, honestly, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is putting together a laser course for pet parents because I foresee that A lot of pet parents will be able to do that at home. Just like one of the things I said to you is laser is huge. And if you know how to do it, it's an amazing tool. Literally. Now, granted, my clients are the creme de la creme, like the the best. uh, I love them all. Um, 70% of my clients have their own laser. Mm -hmm. And when they got it, they had no clue what to do with it. They're willing to spend the money, Mm -hmm. but they don't have the means to learn how to use it. But they know it's a good Mm -hmm. tool. So I foresee a lot of people just like having good dog food and being on good supplements, they're going to be able to laser their dog to help. Vets, in at least in the U.S., you know, I, I have a client who just scheduled an MRI for her dog, and the soonest they could get her in was January 4th. Mm-hmm. This is October, right? That's crazy. So anything we can do to help pets at home and and – decrease the the wait time to get into the vet, I think is beneficial. So I see foresee doggy gyms. I see an increase in doggy daycare. It's kind of like school for dogs. Uh, I foresee people taking better care of their dogs, understanding more with the nutrition and the supplements, the same way you would do the right things for your child. Dogs aren't, for the people in my world, dogs aren't oh, it's the dog that's outside and he has a dog house and a bowl of water. I mean, my dog sleeps in my bed under the covers with his hat on my pillow. 
Mm-hmm. Right. There's times I go to sleep and I'm holding his paw. Right. And there's times that I wake up because he's got all four feet on my back. Right. Just he is, you know, he's so close to me. And I think that is that's the world I like living in. So that's my vision. That's really inspiring and um, touching. I, I, you know, I always think of a world where dogs are, and animals are truly taken as equals to humans. Uh, we have asserted this right to be, to have the so-called top position in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. I so disagree with it. And sometimes when people say, oh, you're feeding your dog human food that is organic or that mm-hmm. is, you know, and what about the people and the children and all that stuff? I say, you know, I think that ideally there should be enough for everyone, but animals are not any less than humans. Mm-hmm. It's just our idea and maybe our insecurity. And I definitely see that the uh, countries and and societies where dogs and animals other animals are treated well and respected and so on they're evolved more and so i i I definitely share the vision of your future and i hope that animals will be equal hence they deserve all the benefits and the the love and care and and respect that that we'd like to get so so really funny when people, because I have a lot of very diverse friends, mm-hmm. and frequently people will say, hey, Lori, how are your kids? And I honestly say, two-legged or four-legged, <laughs> right? Because some people I know don't care about my animals, and that's okay. Yes. And they want to know about my two-legged kids. And some people I know really don't care about my two-legged kids, but they want to know about my animals. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're to me, they're all my kids. Lori, it's been such a pleasure. I can't even thank you enough uh, for your time, for your expertise, for your knowledge, for sharing it so freely. Happy to be here. And I hope we'll connect. I hope we'll connect very soon again because there's going to be a lot of questions and people will, will you know, love your courses. I'm, I'm certain of it because all dog lovers are the same. We just want to make, uh, make sure that our four-legged children mm-hmm. are well and long-living yep. and have a good quality of life. So one more thing, if people are looking for the Core and More Foundational Exercises for Your Pet course, they can go to OptimumPetVitality.com. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye.